Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar um, hosted in conjunction with Social Media Week and Suzy. Uh, I'm Matt Britton. I'm the CEO of Suzy. For those of you who have been on some of our past webinars, uh, you know a little bit about me and what Suzy does. But I'm incredibly excited here today to welcome longtime friend and colleague, um, sometimes my secret idol, <laughs> Toby Daniels. Toby, it's great to see you virtually. Definitely missing you in person, but thank you for joining. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm just looking at my photograph on this slide here, and I barely even recognize who that guy is. But uh, I appreciate you. Uh, this is my this is my sort of uh, my COVID look, but uh, I appreciate you having <laughs> me to be part of this. Thanks so much. You, you got you got the quarantine beard, but you're able to pull it off. So good for you. <laughs> so um, Toby and I want to get together today and share some of the research that we found at Suzy and some of the insights Toby's seeing from his world at Social Media Week in terms of how the use of social media has evolved during this crisis. Um, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform. We work with hundreds of brands to allow them to have their finger on the pulse of the consumer by engaging in on-demand research um, across a variety of different sectors. And we used our tool um, comprehensively to identify data today that would inform our insights. So all the information you're gonna be seeing today is, um, you know, unless called out otherwise, was used from our Suzy market research tool. Um, one last thing about Suzy is we have created an insights hub located at suzy.com slash COVID-19. We're continually on a daily basis pushing out stats and insights and things that we're finding in terms of how this crisis is impacting a variety of different industries and the consumer. So feel free to check that out um, and I hope you guys get value from it. So as I mentioned earlier, we used Suzy to help inform the insights from the study. Uh, we launched one study the week of April 20th to a sample size of 829 consumers. Uh, the sample size, of course, directionally representative of the U.S. consumer and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. We will also be making this deck available as well as the recording of this webinar available to everyone um, after the presentation. You, if you register, you'll be getting an email. Otherwise, you can feel free to reach out to us and of course, share it with uh, as many people as you want. Uh, the purpose of this is really just to add value and show people what we're seeing in the space. So we have broken down today's presentation into four general broad topics. And it's all about how social media is impacting new consumer. The first of which is people. How are consumers using social media differently to communicate with other consumers, friends, family members, colleagues, coworkers, et cetera, throughout this crisis? The second of which is information. How are consumers using social media to access information, timely information, news about the crisis and about how they should interact with both brands and businesses and the government during this crisis? So we'll be getting into that. The third is entertainment how consumers are using social media to escape and tap into much needed entertainment and relief during this time. And then lastly, brands. How are brands playing a role in this crisis in the use of social media at crafting their narrative and building their brands with consumers? So, you know, when Toby and I were talking about how to structure this, we thought this was the most simplest form. Um, we are going to have some pretty neat interactive elements here that Toby will drive us through in terms of polling that we're trying out during this webinar as well. And uh, we're going to dive into it. So unless you have anything else, Toby, should we just get started? Well, just to mention that you know, the way that we've structured today's uh, webinar just to kind of give people a little bit of a sense of what we're going to be going over. These four sections will be underpinned by uh, the unpacking of the research that we've done and the sharing of insights in each of the different areas. At the end of each section, though, and this is important for everyone to sort of uh, be aware of, um, we will be launching a poll question, which we're looking for everyone to interact with and answer. Um, and we um, will also sort of have sort of a quick sort of Q&A discussion between myself and Matt at the end of each section. We also obviously will be inviting questions over the course of the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, we'll take questions and hopefully we'll have some time for some really like interactive uh, Q&A. So uh, let's get on with it. Yeah, and once again, thank you all for joining. We hope everyone is faring as well as possible through all this. So the first section is about connecting with people and how social media has impacted the way that consumers connect with each other in ways we've never really seen before um, prior to this crisis occurring. Consumers are generally using social media far more during this crisis than they were before 
before it started. And you could, you know, probably guess a lot of reasons why. First and foremost, especially it goes to younger kids. You know, they're able to be on their phones in between classes now, where many kids who went to school prior weren't able to access their phone during the school day and school hours. And the same probably goes for many of us. I think with the merging of our home life and our business life, we probably find ourselves kind of mixing back and forth throughout, uh, you know, every day. And because of it, many consumers are using social media more than they ever have in the past. And in that regard, over half of consumers told us they're not really paying attention to the amount of time they're spending on social media platforms. You know, the new iOS a couple of years ago allowed you to um, basically control your screen time. And Instagram about a year ago basically started saying, you've been on Instagram for 45 minutes. I see that a lot now. You should not see it. I don't know, Toby, are you using social media more than you used to? Yeah, I, I am. And I think it's really important to understand the, the, some of the sort of fundamental reasons why that's the case. And of course, we're all sort of sheltering in place. We are all physically isolated from one another. And that's obviously going to make us want to reach out and connect much more than we perhaps would normally. Also, we have to think about the ways in which our days have like changed, the way that the structure of our day used to get up get dressed, go to work, come home. Our days were just like organized in, in, in sort of very specific sections. Now our days just feel completely fluid, days merge into each other. And so our ability to even like check how much time we're spending on social media is just made that much more difficult. And in, in some ways it's a good thing. And of course it's not necessarily always positive. And we're gonna have to sort of look very closely at some of the kind of like the more detrimental kind of impacts and effects of the fact that we are using so much social media so much more than we were before. Yeah. Uh, we dug a little bit deeper into what are the top platforms for consumers during the crisis. And despite all the talk that we've heard over the last five years of Facebook being dead, it still really reigns supreme amongst mainstream America um, in terms of the most used platform. YouTube coming in second, obviously YouTube being a huge entertainment based platform, Instagram uh, coming in third. And, you know, I had some suspicious, suspicious going into this that maybe Instagram would be used slightly less just because Instagram its core purpose was really about sharing experiences and people are having less experiences now by nature, but you do find people finding very creative ways to use Instagram and then TikTok really starting to surface and really starting to grow. And we're going to be really diving deep into TikTok um, a little bit later in this presentation. But I mean, a key point is that amongst the 18 to 24 demographic, TikTok is now the primary platform for consumers. You know, this is a platform that no one was really talking about two years ago. Um, Instagram really was reigning supreme for such a long time. Uh, Snapchat made its run at the 18 to 24 demographic. And now TikTok has really taken over as the de facto platform. And it's something that I think more brands need to pay attention to both during this crisis and coming out of it. Yeah, I think also, I mean, first of all, we've seen a massive increase in the number of people who are either reactivating their Facebook accounts or joining Facebook for the first time because it offers such an incredibly important utility at this time in terms of how we connect with our friends and family. That was always the case, but people are now seeking out that use of social media so much more today than they were before. And of course, like, so utility is an important thing. And of course, entertainment, access of entertainment is an important thing as well, because everybody at this, night, this time needs um, needs needs that escape, you know, needs to sort of access content and be able to connect with like celebrities and entertainment just to make us sort of feel good and, and to enable us to get through the day. Yeah, absolutely. And in that regard, uh, sales of off-premise liquor is also up 30% during this crisis. So everyone's yeah. got a different vice. Some people it's TikTok, some people it's vodka, but um, we found that people definitely need that sort of escape uh, with all the, you know, crazy news surrounding us. So when we dug deeper into consumers in terms of how they're using social media, uh, we really found sort of this bifurcation. 55% of consumers are using it primarily to communicate with other people, friends and family. Um, and about a third are using it really to stay up to date with news and current events. You know, when we did uh, our State of the U.S. Consumer webinar, which Susie has now done three of and we're doing on a bi-weekly basis, we identified some interesting statistics, including the fact that consumers really are leaning into traditional newspaper brands uh, in terms of who they trust. And in a world where everyone says print is dead, I thought that was, you know, quite provocative that we uncovered that. Um, you know, but on the same token, consumers are also going to social media and different channels to stay in touch with current events. Um, why are consumers turning to social platforms to communicate? Well, it, you know, obviously they feel that they have the connection there. They have um, their networks there. They feel it's easy and they feel it's a good way to build community. However, 
uh, obviously with any crisis, you're going to have negativity uh, creep in. Some consumers actually think that social media is an impersonal way to connect. And at, at a time where many people want to lean into closer friends and a more tight knit community in that regard, they'd rather actually, you know, use other mediums to communicate. And there obviously is the notion of misinformation and whether it's, um, you know, companies putting out truly fake news or, um, you know, trying to sell masks when they're really not selling masks. We've obviously seen um, an evil side come out to this, as you will in any crisis. Um, and, you know, obviously consumers are very much aware of it. Yeah, and I think I'd add to that, you know, we're, we're obviously, what's, what's unique about the current situation is that we are all experiencing this, the same crisis at the same time. You know, I, I think there was a, a wonderful quote that I sort of stole from someone, which is that, you know, we're, we're, we're not necessarily in the same boat, but we are all experiencing the same storm. And what's important about that is to think about it in context, right, to communication. Context drives communication. Context, you know, is the way in which we sort of like organize around the things that we care about. And shared context is obviously a very powerful driver of connection. I think that's a, a, a big factor when we look at these, some of these numbers. Absolutely. So this is really interesting because when we ask consumers, when you're keeping in touch with friends and family, what, what channel or platform do you move the, use the most? And the good old fashioned telephone is one that popped up for many consumers as one that they still use. And, you know, I think we forget that the telephone still exists now. People are probably aren't using landlines anymore, but they are still making phone calls. Um, Facebook, obviously a core way. And you start to see some new platforms creep up. You know, you talk about the consumerization of the enterprise and enterprise level tools actually being adopted by consumers through this. And lo and behold, you see a tool like Zoom, uh, where nearly 20% of consumers now are saying they're using Zoom to keep in touch with friends and family. This is a tool that very few people outside of the business world really knew about going into this. And now it's very quickly become a consumer brand going from 10 million users to nearly 300 million users throughout this crisis. A quick, yeah, well, a quick, quick anecdote on that. It's also interesting to see um, the growth across these different sort of platforms and channels across demographics as well. Um, I actually hosted a, 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 a birthday party for my two-year-old daughter and I was inviting my mom to join via Zoom. And I said, mom, you're going to have to d download the Zoom app. And she says, what are you talking about? I use it for church every week. Yeah, it's, it's incredible in terms of how quickly that's obviously spread. And yeah. brands know it. Brand knows, brands know that Zoom has now been kind of pushed to, um, you know, the, the tip of the tongues of so many different consumers who didn't know it prior. You know, Burger King is offering free Whoppers for, for consumers that's using, um, you know, their, their out-of-home billboards um, as Zoom backgrounds. So they're basically saying, interact with our ads and, and bring it to Zoom and we'll give you a free Whopper. And it's an interesting, you know, activation for a brand like Burger King, who's always doing, I feel like, interesting and innovative things in social media to really, um, you know, grab onto this trend. But now, obviously, is what always seems to happen with every emerging tech tool, the big titans come in, right? So Zoom took off. And then Microsoft obviously made a huge push with Microsoft Teams. Um, and now you have Google launching a Zoom rival called Meet that they're obviously offering free to consumers. You know, they are not charging consumers to use, um, you know, most of the functionality with Zoom. If you're not a paid subscriber, you get cut off after a certain amount of time. Um, and Google's really saying, you know, this is our time and we're going to, we're a trusted uh, technology company. I don't know, Toby, if you have thoughts in terms of the big platforms getting into video sharing and what we see in the future maybe with other entrants into the space. Well, I think the key thing, so you know, I think we're seeing the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest shift in, in, in user behavior, in human behavior, probably actually since like the birth of like the, the, the PC and the advent of the internet, because of course, like everyone is sharing a face, everyone is working remotely and everyone has to, they don't have much of a choice, start to use these different tools and technologies just to be functional in life, not just to sort of stay in touch with their friends and family, but also just to be productive as professionals. So that shift in, in, in sort of human and user behavior is really important. Uh, and of course, you know, many of the technology companies have already developed these types of video conferencing technologies, but because we're now seeing the way in which we're, they're being used, the technology companies are very rapidly like shipping new products or updates to these products to sort of try and ride that kind of user behavior wave. 
Um, of course, we have to talk about like Facebook as well. Facebook Messenger Rooms just launched, I think, in the last like few days. So that's their, their entrant into this particular kind of part of the market. And ultimately, I think what's important, we sort of like want to ask the question, well, you know, who are going to be the winners in this type of situation? You know, is, you know, Zoom's obviously growing a lot. Is it going to stick around? We don't know. But what's key when you talk about Microsoft Teams, when you talk about Google Meet, or you talk about Facebook Messenger Rooms, is the fact that they are already plugged into these massive platforms that already have huge right. scale. Um, and 300 million might sound a lot, but when you're a Facebook platform or when you're Instagram, when you're talking in the billions, pretty tiny in comparison so it's going to be interesting yeah to see. it's going to be interesting though because when you when i see kids you know i have two kids 12 and 14 and they they're using zoom for school right because a lot of the schools are adopting it some schools uh new york city public education system actually didn't no longer allowed um the schools to actually use it for security concerns and that was a big thing to happen but i think there's just a ton of functionality uh missing from a platform like Zoom or uh, you know Google Meet to allow kids to actually have fun when collaborating. I saw yesterday the news of a company uh, called Squad, which is a mobile first device that was almost like a combination of Zoom and House Party, where kids can actually share what's on their one, one of their phones. So they're scrolling through Instagram or TikTok, and, and then they see all their friends on the phone as well, and they're kind of collaborating over content. So I think you're gonna to continue to see a lot of innovations in the space. I think from the enterprise perspective, a lot of these tools are super adequate. When it comes to kids wanting to elaborate because they actually can't hang out together, I think there's a lot of room for innovation. I think you're gonna certainly see a lot of that moving forward. Yeah. So what type of content uh, are consumers posting? Has that changed? And you know, what we've seen is, first of all, a lot of the same. We've seen consumers still trying to entertain one another, um, but we've seen also a lot of inspirational posts to try to uplift with people, people who are lucky enough to be working at home and not be sick or have a family member that's sick is you know, obviously trying to add back and give value to others and really trying to either provide guidance or inspirational posts. I don't know if you've seen kind of the tone change a bit in terms of the type of content consumers are posting since this crisis uh, began. You know, I think one data point that definitely is missing here that either we should sort of think about or, or, or spend some time sort of, you know, digging into in future research is, um, what is the percentage of content that's being shared by people right now that's COVID related? Because it sort of feels to me like it's the majority, right? In part because out, out of necessity, people just feel yeah. compelled to want to be talking about this. But also because Absolutely. like when you see a piece of content that's not COVID related, you're like, oh, wait, you know, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel like there's a right. place for it in the conversation at this point. I also felt like we reached like peak pandemic when my dad started sending me inspirational quotes via WhatsApp. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh my <laughs> so true. And brands, to your point, are also pushing uh, consumers to generate content around the crisis. Um, Lowe's invited do it yourselfers to create expressions for frontline heroes and frontline workers. Um, you know, so kind of a user generated uh, social responsibility effort by Lowe's that really kind of combines both of those efforts. But you're right. And I think w one, I guess, harbinger of when maybe this crisis might be starting to turn and I was seeing light at the end of the tunnel is consumers posting about different things. I don't know, maybe their plans for the fall or maybe hopefully the NFL football or who knows. But right now, it's almost like, what else are you going to post? And, you know, a lot of people are getting backlash for not um, really being, you know, relevant with the times and being tone deaf. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about influencers. All right. So now we're going to get to the poll. So this is your opportunity, guys, to get involved. So we're throwing up a quick poll question here. Do you believe that you will maintain the same level of connectivity with friends and family via social media after the lockdown ends we'll leave that poll open for about 30 to 60 seconds i'll come back to it in just a second but i have a question for matt matt do you think that yeah. covid19 is helping us as marketers like better act on our moral obligations to drive a more trustworthy and positive shared experience during this time well i think it's forcing brands to do so you know i mean i i look at it as the shift from advertising to content which we've been talking about for so long advertising is pushing your unique selling proposition, you know, 20% more absorbent, 350 horsepower, V6 engine, you know, selling your stuff. That's advertising. Content is who is my consumer? What do they think about when they wake up in the morning? And where's my brand fit in? And right now there's not really much room for brands to advertise. So I think content is really the only game in town. And again, content comes with a consumer first mentality. And I think brands kind of have to adopt that right now. Right, right. Okay, this is super interesting. I'm definitely spend a couple of minutes talking about it. So the poll results are in. So do you believe that you will maintain the same level of connectivity with friends and family via social media after lockdown ends? Yes, 48%, no, 52%. So 
pretty much an even split. Matt, thoughts on that? I mean, not surprised. I mean, I think this is a question where each consumer is going to sort of interpret it differently. Um, I think ultimately it all depends upon how this ends. I think we don't really know what the world's going to look like. So we don't know if we're going to be able to see people, you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five -on -five or how long we're going to be in the current state. And I think that's why people are going to interpret a question like this differently. I'll add one more thing. I also think if you ask someone the question on different days, you might get like completely different results. People just are fluctuating between feeling very inspired and wanting to be proactive in terms of how they connect. And at the same time, also wanting to kind of retreat and sort of distance themselves from social media connectivity because it sometimes feels very overwhelming. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, ne the next uh, section is about celebrities and influencers. And, you know, Toby and I were talking prior to this webinar starting just in terms of how this has really humanized celebrities. Um, you know, it's really pushed celebrities almost to the same plane as influencers and in some way just everyday consumers and that they're not behind the bright lights anymore. They're home just like the rest of us. Um, I don't know if you watched Saturday Night Live um, this past week, but it was just so cool to see, you know, Adam Sandler, uh, you know, an A-list uh, superstar, um, you know, basically film something in his home with his wife and his daughter. Um, so it really has brought back sort of the heyday of user-generated content. No, absolutely. I was, I'm a huge SNL fan. It's been, it's been so great to kind of like watch those guys trying to figure out how to execute on something that's just like so intricate and so complicated. I, I have to say, I even look at what they're able to achieve in their own homes and it's pretty, it's pretty impressive from a production standpoint. It really is. Although this week they, they stopped doing it live, which is why I think they were able to, you know, up the production value. I think live was a little bit too audacious. Although the NFL draft, which is much more of a, um, you know, grid-like format, they did an incredible job at the NFL Draft Live. So going back to social media, you know, a majority of them believe that social platforms do provide them entertainment. That's why they go to it, not just to communicate with others. And when we dug into where you primarily get your entertainment, I mean, there you go seeing TikTok as a, as a huge place. And um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Toby. I thought it was super interesting in terms of how it jumped to the top. Yeah, I mean, I think so. First of all, whenever you, TikTok is mentioned in the same breath as any other social media platform, people tend to kind of talk about Instagram, maybe Snapchat. But the point is that TikTok really does stand alone as a uh, entertainment platform, right? A new category of entertainment or a new way of consuming entertainment content. In a way, TikTok's much more like YouTube than it is like Instagram. And I think it's just fascinating to see the way in which it's grown, of course, over the last, like, let's say, 18 months, two years. But, but during this time, and in particular, given the fact that everyone is like basically at home, TikTok's coming into its own because of the fact that it is just so much easier to create and distribute really compelling content, even if you're having to do so from home in a little bit of a DIY fashion. In a way, the more DIY it feels, the better, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and live obviously is something that TikTok is playing in a little bit, but not really known as much of a live platform, but we start to see really a renaissance of live when, when Instagram first pushed Instagram live, it took off and then kind of didn't because most of the content was very bad and the many celebrities didn't really, you know, engage in it. But now we see basically nearly half of consumers saying they've watched some type of live stream on social media in the past two weeks. That's a massive number. Um, again, and, and again, not, yeah. again, this just, it, it comes back to this, like the fact that context matters when it comes to live, like no one really cares that you're going live. If it's not for a specific reason, why should I be part of this moment if this moment isn't necessarily relevant to me? But of course, at this point, you want to connect with people in real time live because we are all sharing this like same extraordinary experience. Yeah, and, and not there's no live sports, right? There's no live award shows, like other things that you could uh, look into live. You don't real, you can't really do anymore. So I think that there's really a thirst for that. People can't go to live concerts; they can't live their life the normal way. So I think you know there's a big stir thirst for it. And when we ask what type of live stream content consumers are seeking out, um, you know, we really got three major categories. The first of which is a skills based class remotely. Many consumers are really wanting to use this time to for self improvement to learn about new things that they haven't in the past. Um, whether it's something like, um, you know, Skillshare or Masterclass, we're seeing, a, you know, a huge push in that. And it'll be interesting to see 
where colleges and universities had in the fall as it comes to remote learning. We did a huge um, um, study for Microsoft about remote learning and learned that, you know, while workers find themselves in many instances more productive, uh, students cannot say the same thing. Uh, then we have fitness. Um, we've seen a huge boom in online fitness. Consumers want to stay active, many of which in cities are stuck in their apartments and they're really seeking out this type of content. You have everyone from SoulCycle, the Barry's Bootcamp, really jumping on um, board with pushing out uh, live content. Um, and then you have platforms like Peloton and Tonal and Mirror who were built for remote uh, fitness really taking off through this. And then lastly, and this is an area that I think is going to continue to grow, is live streaming of a DJ or, or musical artist. And, you know, females actually over-index more than males in this area. And it's just it's been incredible to see which artists have really seized the moment in that regard. I don't know, Toby, if you have any other thoughts in terms of the live content consumers are seeking out. I, I, I know ultimately we're going to be short on time. This is definitely an area that I want to spend a couple minutes talking about. So first of all, I think people are really looking forward to not going to a nightclub and spending like $500 on a bottle of vodka. So that's probably another reason why people are jumping on like these live events. And I think it's really interesting, particularly, again, demographically speaking, just because you're in your 40s and you've got kids doesn't mean that you still don't love the music. You don't want to access that live experience. And I think that's like really important. I've certainly loved some of the kind of the, the, the house music kind of, you know, DJs yeah. who have just been doing, extraordinary, uh, it's doing these extraordinary performances. And then also, you know, I think just to go back aside for a second, Matt, I, I also think that um, um, th th you're looking at here, not just trends that are relevant to the moment we're in right now, but these are the things that are actually, from a user behavior standpoint, going to stick around. And then I just want to like throw in a quick plug, and this is the only time I'll be sort of in any way self-promotional, but like social media, we, we pivoted into our own online version of our conferences, which will be launching next week. SMW1 is a, going to be a hundred hours of like live streamed content, providing access to education and workshops and talks and panel sessions and what, what, and what have you. And that's very much in response to the fact that we can't host physical events. But what's interesting is the reaction and response to that has just been extraordinary. And we're like super excited to see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say on that regard, Toby, the way that your organization, I remember we were talking in February and we were saying, well, do we think Social Media Week New York's going to be canceled? And you're like, well, I, I sure as hell hope not. That's a huge event for us. And obviously the live in-person event was canceled, but the way the organization pivoted and worked with all your content providers and have been working with the technology and the content, it's just been really inspiring. And anyone who's watching this webinar who has the ability to support an organization like Social Media Week, um, a live event company that is going through this and getting hit the hardest, you know, I would definitely urge you to do so. It's just been really inspiring to see. And I know you're going to pull through that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, um, and in that regard, in terms of live DJ events, like somebody like D-Nice was a DJ that was kind of mid-tier going into this. Is, is a great example of somebody taking advantage of the moment. Um, every night he's going on for two different uh, DJ sets to really just get people dancing, get people moving from his own apartment. And he's had everybody from Michelle Obama uh, to Drake to Jennifer Lopez um, log in and actually create a comment. And there's something cool as a consumer about knowing that you're watching the same thing that the celebrity has because many people can't get in the same parties as those people, you know, during normal times. And I think, you know, he's done just an incredible job of giving back. He's not trying to show anything, although lately he has been starting to sell his hats, but we all need to make money, right? But he's done a great job and he's really set the path for so many more artists to, to really be able to express themselves and connect uh, with their fans. Influence is a very interesting topic and something that the press has made a lot about. Some, some individuals feel that influencers should not be really vocal at all during this time. And other people feel that influencers are kind of like their virtual friend who they've been following in their lives all, you know, all throughout. And now more than ever, they need that consistency and they want to hear from those people. Um, you know, we asked consumers what they want to hear from influencers and they said everything from info information, positive messaging, and even some promotions and giveaways. How do you feel about influencers in general during this time, Toby? Well, listen, I think it's, it's a, a, an important time, not just for influencers and celebrities and brands, but for all of us to sort of think about the contribution that we want to make at this time and making sure that those contributions matter and make a difference in our really just have like purpose behind them, right? Frivolous, yeah. silly, unnecessary or unimportant content does not have a place at this time. So the people will thrive during this, or survive during this time and then thrive um, as we come out of it are the, the influencers that really understand that incredibly important point. Absolutely, and we've seen 
some influencers win and some really have a hard time faring through this. Um, this is Ariel Charnis um, with her husband, otherwise known as something Navy, a huge fashion lifestyle blogger who had just built a massive following and frankly, a massive business with partnerships with companies like Nordstrom going into this. And she had a little bit of a slip up during this, right? Or I should say a big slip up. Um, it turns out that she told everyone that she had um, was tested positive for the virus. Uh, she lives in New York. She was also renting a house um, out in the Hamptons. And long before the 14 day, um, you know, period came up where she should be quarantining, she started posting pictures of herself being in the Hamptons. And she posted live video with a housekeeper in the background. And she was showcasing wealth. And it just came off as incredibly tone deaf to the extent that she started to get a backlash both by the press. It was in the New York Post. It was in so many different individual publications, as well as her audience itself. She went dark for a couple of weeks, which is something that most mainstream influencers would never do. And then now has come back in and, you know, she's very clearly, um, you know, filtering and moderating the comments that come in and she's trying to ease her way back into it. And, you know, she's done an incredible job with her audience. And frankly, like, I always love to see women built businesses like this and she, she's done it on her own and she's worked so hard to do it. So I don't think her business deserves to be taken down um, at, at, through this, but I do think she's going to have to rebuild trust both with her brand partners and her audience. So it's going to be really interesting to see how she does it. Any thoughts on something Navy and, and other influencers that may have been slightly tone deaf through this? Story? No, I, I think you've covered it. Nothing, nothing really huge to add here other than the fact that like, look guys, read the room, you know, it's not hard. Um, there's an extraordinary amount of like devastating things happening to people around the room, just, just around the world. Just like read the room. Um, yep. And I think yep. this is a great example of what happens when you don't. Yeah, and conversely, some like Danielle Bernstein, otherwise known as We Were What, has done an amazing job. She has, you know, really struck the balance of still pushing in lifestyle content because people follow these fashion influencers and bloggers because they want, they're interested in their lives. They want to see where they're living through this, what they're wearing, how they're keeping on. But what she's done is, first of all, really set the model in terms of staying focused, continuing to build their business. And more recently of late, pushing small businesses and trying to be philanthropic and actually give back. So she struck that right balance of maintaining her cool factor and adding value while giving back. And I think, you know, that's really the model for so many influencers to actually move in going forward. And, and hopefully, you know, they all can because they've all built incredible businesses, you know, building an audience of 2 million people from scratch and sharing your life every single day is incredibly hard and takes incredible sacrifice. So you don't wanna see somebody because they made one mistake during unprecedented times, lose all that. But if they make the wrong decision, I think it's important to be honest, to be candid, and then take the right steps to regain that trust. Yeah, well said. Um, so TikTok, um, you know, Toby, we, we've spoken so much about TikTok. I mean, global downloads of, of TikTok um, from the, the, the first three weeks of March are up 5% globally over month over month and that will probably be the case in april as well it continues to grow you're talking about 84 million global downloads in a, in a three-week period uh and obviously when you look at TikTok, you see over a third of 18 and 24 year olds using it and now you see 25 to 34 year olds use it as well so now it's you know you had this element with facebook where it started off in the college market and the teens and everyone used it and so do you think TikTok is going to be something that's going to follow the same path is this going to be a mainstream every demographic platform in the next year. Listen, I mean, first of all, you know, we, we talk a lot about TikTok and um, they've been given the greatest playbook imaginable when it comes to thinking about how to avoid like all of the sort of the pitfalls and problems that all the other social media platforms have experienced. So TikTok gets a lot of credit, I think sometimes for the things that it does that are essentially just like complete copycat features or functionality that already previously existed on like the Instagrams or the Facebooks. Um, having said that though, I think what's really interesting about TikTok is the speed at which they are innovating, the, the speed at which they're shipping new products, the fact that they're experimenting with features that are designed at this moment in time to be able to kind of make it easy for people to help self-organize around kind of critical issues and to, you know, to reach out and sort of in, engage with people. So I think it's really interesting on a, on a number of levels. In terms of the demographic shift, absolutely. Of course, TikTok absolutely has to claim um, some stake in every single demographic as they continue sure. to grow. And the way that they will do that is not necessarily going away from what's kind of like core and in their DNA as this like very unique way in which you can kind of create and consume entertainment content 
But I think also in terms of the value it creates and the way it serves the different sort of demographics, that's also going to be interesting. Another quick stat that I came across recently, which I think is super interesting, is that 70% of 10-year-olds in America are on TikTok, TikTok which is just like mind-blowing when you think about it. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, TikTok's, supposed to be, of course. yeah, they've done a lot of things right in terms of discovery when you jump on TikTok for the first time, you're automatically seeing a feed yeah. of information. It's incredibly easy to adopt. I also think it's a, it's a, it's a um, economic equalizer, if you will, amongst consumers because Instagram kind of became a platform where people flex their car or their house or how much money they had or where they can travel, where TikTok is truly about creativity. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, you just need a phone mm -hmm. and, 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 a, and a smart creative brain and you can win on TikTok. And I think that I love about it. And I think Instagram, if there's one thing about it that I don't love is that there's just so many people that are just flexing what they have. And especially in a world like that we live in today, that just doesn't really fly. So this was yeah, really interesting. Also, it, yeah, go on. Go on all go I was going to say is it's also interesting in the way that like, these these platforms can kind of um, you know create and shape culture. I mean, look at the impact that TikTok is having on the music industry right now, and on yeah. the art, artist like creation process and the way they're sort of thinking about how they actually can create art, but specifically for certain platforms. And I'm not saying TikTok was necessarily the first to kind of like um, have that type of impact, but we are seeing an acceleration of it. I think at this time. Absolutely, absolutely. So think uh, talking about impact on the music industry, and shout out to my 12 year old son Cameron who who, um, you know, let me into the, what this, this was happening. Um, but Fortnite did an incredible activation. For those of you who don't know what Fortnite is, uh, it's one of the fastest growing, most valuable video games in the world that's streamed on mobile devices as well as gaming platforms like Xbox. And they, it's, it's basically a virtual world that kids play in. And over the course of the last couple of years, they've done these big activations with artists and celebrities where essentially you can attend a live concert. And when my son told me about this, I literally thought he was going to be playing live somewhere and just streaming it like we see on Instagram Live, but it wasn't anything like it. It was pre-recorded, but essentially you enter this world and there was four or five different times where you can log in and do it. And basically, Travis Scott, who's a huge artist, right? He basically became huge on screen. He, he became larger than life and your character in Fortnite was still the same character and you could move around and get different views and interact with them. It was basically five minutes long. Graphically, it was just incredible. It was something you would almost think the pay to see. And Travis Scott gets to build his brand. Fortnite has appointment viewing. Um, it's a great way to promote the artists. And I'm like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, wow, this is the future. It's just interactive entertainment at its finest. And 12 million people watched this. Uh, the DJ Marshmallow uh, participated in a similar event uh, six to nine months ago when he had 10 million people. So it's clearly growing. Um, and it'll just be interesting to see how this, uh, you know, evolves moving forward. Any thoughts on, on Fortnite or Travis Scott or should we jump into the polls, Toby? Let's, let's jump into the polls. I'm definitely conscious of, uh, of time. So next couple yeah. question, guys. Do you feel a greater sense of connection with celebrities and influencers during COVID-19? Again, we'll leave that poll up for a minute or so. Um, the question for you, Matt. What, what, so you touched on influences at the, at the end there. I, I'm sort of curious to, to hear your thoughts on how you see the influencer landscape actually evolving and changing in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So, I mean, I've for a very long time thought that brand relationships with influencers was going to be more marriages and less one night stands. Mm -hmm. We went through a period where brands were trying to shill everything through every individual who would actually hold their product and post something. And I think consumers quickly saw that as quite inauthentic. Um, and now what's starting to happen is you have rising TikTok stars like Charlie D'Amelio, right? People who aren't household names in the Hollywood lexicon, but they have larger audiences than, you know, Hollywood actors are. So I think what's going to start to happen is the cream is going to rise to the top. You're going to have A-list celebrities and influencers who are going to get long-term sponsorship and endorsement deals with brands. And it's going to kind of wash out everything else uh, because especially in a world of pay to play in social media, you know, I think brands are going to be doing um, more of less, you know, more promotion with less content and more high quality content. Looks like we have another split field. Um, yeah. So do you feel a greater sense of connection with celebrities and influencers during COVID-19? 52%, 49%. Any thoughts on that? No, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think it all depends on what, 
you know, what celebrities people follow. I think this has been a little bit of an equalizer with celebrities where, you know, you're starting to see celebrities in their own homes. You're starting to see them kind of become humanized. I think many celebrities haven't really stepped it up the way that we may have hoped they went through this. So, you know, I think we used to put them on a pedestal, maybe not so much coming out of this. Totally, totally. All right, let's get into the next section. Yeah, so how are consumers connecting with information um, in this time where consumers are seeking out uh, information it's so important to them? Um, about half believe that social media has evolved during a crisis, giving them better access to information. Obviously, you have um, organizations like uh, the World Health Organization um, posting really valuable information. In this instance, how should you wash your fruits and vegetables? I mean, people are constantly seeking um, for information. You have live streams, which really become the modern day fireside chats um you know governor cuomo has really built himself a little bit of a cult following with his daily briefings during the week um it's actually seven days a week where he comes with his team live from albany talking about all the great things that the state of new york is trying to do to control this crisis so you know they're using social media a government organization in their own way to really give people on-demand access and when i'm watching it i'm, I'm like well why didn't governments do this all along um because i think you know people really appreciate it also, um, unlike, unlike yeah. broadcast media, social media provides like such an incredible feedback loop for these people that are like out there in the sort of the public domain or in the mainstream. So if you look actually at the way in which his briefings have evolved and changed over the course of the last like five weeks or so, I would say that's in large part because of the feedback and the interaction that he has through social media versus um, that <laughs> one way one way medium that is broadcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Facebook is, is obviously trying to do their part. Um, I think Facebook has done a fairly good job during this. You know, they've yeah, caught so much flack starting with the election in 2016 and so many other issues that occurred afterwards. And I think they've really stepped it up to try to give back and, and are really trying to use this as an opportunity to change your perception in terms of a trusted platform. I don't know if you feel the same way, Toby, but it's been it's been good to see. I do. And I think that both from the public sort of facing perspective and the way in which they are being perceived, uh, that's changed. I think the sentiment is much more positive now. You and I also know a ton of people at Facebook. I actually interviewed Shauna Sweeney yesterday on the SMW One show. And she yeah. had some really interesting things just to say in terms of like what, what the tone is like internally, like how are they sort of reorganized? And she said she's never been more inspired by an organization's um, ability to be able to pivot in the moment and to recognize its purpose and responsibility and obligation at this time and reorganize yeah. everything it does around trying to figure out how to help in this moment. So yeah. I think the, I, I, I'm with I you. Agree. I think they're doing a good job. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, like how a platform forms, you know, negatively impacting U.S. response. So there's obviously a downside to social media. It, we, we've heard about it ad nauseum. You know, some people feel like that the platforms need to be doing a better job at containing the spread of misinformation. Um, some feel like that they're politicizing or having a polarized response. We know that that could be an echo chamber effect where the more left you are, the more left content you have and same, the more right you're leaning. Uh, some people feel it's increasing anxiety levels or, or downplaying the severity. And obviously it depends upon what platforms you're on, who you follow, et cetera. I look at social media as always been a reflection of society. So I think what you're gonna find negative in society, you're gonna find on social media. And that seems to be the case here. It's definitely a two-way mirror. Yeah. So uh, we, it looks like we have a poll as well for yeah. Um, information. Yeah, let's jump in. So uh, do you believe that social platforms are providing access to accurate information this time? Let's hope it's not a split field again because, uh, you know, we need, we need something to talk about. Um, all right. So I have a quick, one more quick question for you, Matt. Um, personally, like how are you cutting through the clutter of information that we're seeing today? Like what, um, yeah. what are you sort of, what are you making of these like new influences that are shaping our understanding of trust and privacy? Like, uh, like Dr. Sanjay Gupta. <laughs> so that or doctor, I actually did a post on LinkedIn that I said, Dr. Fauci is a new Dr. Dre. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I it's, saw that. Interesting. It's, pretty good. Yeah. it's interesting who you, you know, seek out for me. I only use Twitter to get information. I use every other platform, um, maybe LinkedIn more for specific business information. But if you're looking for um, just general business or news information, I use Twitter. I have a list. I found Twitter lists to be incredibly impactful where I highly curate those lists. If I'm looking for news, there's only certain people I want to hear from. If I'm looking for information on my beloved Philadelphia Eagles, there's only certain people I want to hear from. And I found Twitter to be an incredible platform in that regard. Do you trust people or institutions in that in that context when it comes to well, that? I mean, there really 
I, I mean, people, I think like, I actually, when you think of the future of news, I think we're going to be trusting the reporters versus the news itself. Um, and I think that the individuals, you know, brands are people, people are brands. It's really the people behind them. So I think it really is the individuals. How about you? Hmm. I don't know, man. It's, I, it, I, my list is so highly curated, but I think they're probably an even split between institutions and of course the people who are attached to them, but then, you know, independent voices as well. Um, yeah. it's, it's probably an even split. I'll be honest. Yeah, no, I get that. All right, let's get oh. back to the poll results. So do you believe the social platforms are providing access to accurate information? 62% of people said yes. Thoughts? Um, I mean, I think most consumers, if they're following the right people, there's no reason it shouldn't be accurate. I think, you know, there's some people, you know, that trust, um, you know, individuals they follow. There's other people that don't, you know? So I think it just, it really depends on the individual experience. It does. And you have to remember, of course, that, you know, social media gets obviously a lot of flack in terms of like the spread of misinformation. But we also have to understand that like, you know, traditional media has like existed um, in a sort of biased sense for, you know, decades. And so if you yeah. only lock into and get your information from a single media institution, it's likely to be biased in some particular way. And it's likely the information that you're going to get is is very much kind of speaking to who you are as a person. So I think it's also important to kind of factor that in. All right, let's get exactly. into our Yeah, we're in our final section. section. Yeah, connecting with brands. And, you know, consumers still believe brands should be part of the mix. You know, half of consumers think that uh, brands should remain an integral part of the social media experience. So there are some, and you see, you know, people posting all the time on platforms like LinkedIn saying, this is not a time for brands to speak, but I think brands are a trusted entity. And I think consumers trust brands and in times like this, brands need to step it up. But the question is how they're doing it as we talked about, and, and we'll get into much further in this section. And in terms of brands being an integral part of the experience, it's now more inexpensive and more efficient than ever for brands to be part of the experience. So Facebook's um, advertising cost per thousand or how much it costs to reach a thousand people is basically an all time low. Uh, and for those of you who don't understand how this works, uh, basically buying programmatically or buying ads on a platform like Facebook or Google is essentially an auction where there's supply and demand dynamics at play. The more people that want to advertise, especially towards a certain audience, the higher the rates, the less people, the lower the rates. And right now, if you think about the, the, the huge group of advertisers who essentially are spending nothing right now, you know, whether it be a company like Uber or a company like uh, Marriott or a company like Delta um, or Kayak, there's so many industries and companies that don't find a need to advertise because there's no way they can drive an ROI. And because of it, there's less advertising coming in. And because there's less advertising coming in, for those that do advertise, it's more efficient than ever before. So, you know, it's just interesting. Some brands like P&G have said, we are not going dark through this. This is the time when great brands are built. I happen to agree with that. Um, yeah. But not all brands have the stomach for that. In terms of who consumers want to hear from, uh, we, we've identified a couple sectors that consumers actually want to hear from. Food and beverage brands. Uh, we talked a lot about our state of the US, U.S. consumer webinars about how consumers are cooking more than ever before because they're not going to restaurants and how this is bringing a great renaissance of the American family cooking a family dinner. Um, entertainment companies, because obviously they need to be entertained. They need to know what's on Netflix. They need to hear um, what's coming on next. And then healthcare companies. How can I stay safe? How can I keep my family safe through this. And most importantly, no matter what sector, they're really looking for brands to be informative and honest um, and really brands that are focused on the consumer versus again, pushing their unique pro selling proposition, trying to sell their stuff. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on this, Toby, in terms of brands and how they're, how they're positioning themselves through this. Yeah, I, I do. And I, I sort of want to reference actually like social media Week's global theme this year, which we were working on sort of in mid 2019 is human X. Um, which is looking at the future of marketing needing to be human first and experience driven. Um, you know, it, it felt salient then. It certainly feels even more salient now when you sort of talk about kind of human first marketing and human first principles. Yeah. Um, there's never been a more important time for brands to recognize their own humanity, to recognize their obligations and responsibility in terms of serving at this time. And that's the kind of the key message here is that this is the opportunity to serve. This is your opportunity to think about empathy and compassion in regards to your role and impact on people's lives. Absolutely. And, and you know, we ask consumers um, in that regard, um, you know, how brands can support them. And obviously it's keeping them informed of what's going on. Not every brand feels they, they have a right to play in the space of keeping consumers informed about a health crisis. 
Some just want to entertain, help them escape um, or provide distraction or inspire them. And in that regard, and we've talked about this during our state of the US consumer webinars, um, basically we've identified three pillars of how brands are marketing during the crisis. And it's more true than anywhere as on social media uh, where brands really can play one of these three roles. And we identify it into three buckets, escape, uh, something that helps consumers escape, uh, something that helps them laugh or, or smile or just forget about the crazy world we're living in right now. Community, bringing people further together. You know, there are no more water cooler conversations or people meeting friends at the coffee shop. How can brands kind of, uh, you know, drive that community and drive that connection? And then utility, how, how are brands and big businesses giving back to consumers and aiding them through this crisis are really the three, um, you know, the three elements. And so talking about seeking escape, uh, Toby, you particularly like this um, activation by PNG. Yeah, this is it's hugely interesting. So PNG teamed up with TikTok star Charlie DeMlo, um for what they called the distance dance campaign. And what's important to, to, to know here is, first of all, PNG has always been a brand that has led, particularly with its purpose. It's done some extraordinary things over the years in terms of how it's, um, you know, helped in a number of really important kind of, you know, societal kind of areas and categories. But what's important is the speed at which they responded and recognized that there was an opportunity, but there's also like a, a responsibility they have in terms of helping um, promote this message of um, social distancing. So what they did is they teamed up with Charlie. Um, they launched the Distance Dance campaign, which she kind of spearheaded. And then in a, an incredibly um, fast amount of time, and this really speaks to the power and also potentially the TikTok platform, the video garnered 8 billion views. And wow. even more importantly, I think, has subsequently generated 1.7 million imitation videos. That is just an extraordinary level. Yeah, of and talk about a new celebrity and kind of the divergence of influencer and social media driven stars versus Hollywood stars. And, yeah. you know, this is a TikTok star being taken mainstream uh, yeah. by, you know, one of the most prolific marketers that exists. Um, yeah. You know, we, we continue to see brands invest in live music, live sports. I thought that, you know, what Pepsi did, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the Global Citizen Group recently was incredible. Uh, everybody from the Rolling Stones, Elton John, uh, performed live. And it reminded me of what happened um, after 9-11. And I think hopefully we'll see more of this. It, it raises money. It brings people together. And I think, you know, going back to the NFL draft, I think, you know, the NFL and their partners did such an amazing job seeing these kids in their homes at a moment where they should be on stage for working for 18 years to basically get to that moment. It was, it was, you know, I had bittersweet emotions about that, but that was so well done by the NFL in terms of going forward with the draft. Uh, seeking community. So obviously people are craving a deeper connection experiences. And I thought it was really interesting. I think it's interesting how you have companies like Delta for the first time really pushing their CEO out. So Ed Bashan, our CEO, he is now coming to the forefront and trying to actually be a voice through this. Obviously, the travel industry has been completely, um, you know, damaged through this. And it's going to be interesting to see how quickly they, re, uh, you know, they recover from it. I don't know if you have thoughts about this. We talk about brands or people, people are brands. This is Delta humanizing themselves through their CEO. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's great. I think Delta and Delta CEO has done a great job. I think um, uh, Robin Hayes and JetBlue also is another like leader at an airline that is obviously facing extraordinary time in terms of having to lay off or furlough ten thousand of their employees during this time. But the key is they've got out in front of it. They've been very public facing. They've been leveraging social media as a channel to be able to kind of communicate and also to 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 react and respond and, and to solicit feedback during this time. Again, it's really about like how to um, ad adopt this like human centric approach to how you think about your customers and how you think about your employees at this time. Absolutely. This was an incredible activation uh, done by actually an old high school classmate of mine, an incredible entrepreneur named Michael Rubin, who um, used his connections and, and his friends connections to essentially create a movement which has now raised about $25 million. Uh, they went to every celebrity from Justin Bieber to um, Kevin Hart to Drake to even, again, Charlie D'Amelio. Here she is again, a TikTok star, who basically auctioned off something that you would never be able to get, whether you're going golfing with... 
going to be able to be starring in a film in a film role with Kevin Hart um, or having Justin Bieber come to your house and, and perform a private show. And basically one celebrity challenged another to go all in and raise money. And, you know, we're over $25 million uh, for this um, challenge and it's all being used uh, to basically donate money to food banks and keep people, um, you know, fed. And I just think it's incredible. It's a viral movement that really leverages the best of social media. Um, and all it takes is one great mind like Michael Rubin to basically do it. And it's just, I think, inspiration for all of us to what we can do, what movements can we create in our little circles to really be able to make a difference. And, and, you know, and I'm surprised also, brands haven't gotten more behind this. Yeah. No, on, I, I, what, all I was going to say is just the way it builds as well is really important. Social media plays such an important role at, at, at you know, creating FOMO, often talked about in a negative context. But thinking about all the celebrities that are like, wait a second, I want to get on board and be involved yeah. in this kind of movement. And obviously, when you start to see it on social, it has this like triggering effect, and then people obviously, you know, pile on as a result. And I think that's that's a good thing. Incredible. So uh, moving on, and we have a couple minutes left. Um, lastly, utility and how are brands become a utility. This has been amazing. But a brand like Steakum, right, a brand that sells, uh, you know, uh, steak at the, you know, in the supermarkets is basically saying, you know what, we don't want to talk about steak now. We actually want to become a thought leader through this. And I think it just goes to show you talking about brands are people, people are brands, and how can brands humanize themselves? You know, Steakum basically took the role where we want to be a thought leader through this. And they really broke through by doing so. And it was all about, you know, discussing responsible media consumption and what is the, what is a good brand and what the role brand, brand should play. Um, to Toby, uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about what Netflix and Instagram have done for their mental health series, but I know that, you know, social media, we've done a lot of work in this space. Yeah, no, we've, we've covered this. Um, we've even talked about it on a, on a different sort of podcast. Um, so yeah, so every Thursday at four o'clock, I think four o'clock um, Eastern, Netflix and Instagram have basically have launched a weekly live series entitled Wanna Talk About It. Um, episodes basically feature interviews with like Netflix talent and mental health experts from the National Alliance on Mental, um, mental Illness, Men Mental Health America, and uh, Crisis Text Line. And the ep episodes basically are designed to raise awareness and create like a safe space for people seeking to address the challenges and questions streaming from these like confusing and extraordinary times. And it's been obviously just an amazing amount of people that have been sort of uh, you know, participating. Jerry Harris, uh, Joey King, um, Aisha Bo and all these people that like, you know, basically come on board incredibly quickly. We just think about the speed at which they've like turned this around. And so far, you know, we, we know this, I think over 60% of Instagram's audience is like under 34. Um, yeah. And Netflix, of course, is ranked as the most popular video channel among teens. And so this kind of, these two platforms coming together in recognition of the fact that they're reaching a demographic that needs help during this time, I think is uh, super important. So these types of collaborations are great. What I love about everything that's happening right now, obviously, you know, it, given the fact that we are going through an extraordinary crisis, um, is the fact that people are moving so quickly to figure out how to help. Yep, absolutely. And just lastly, I mean, Platforms are trying to also build it. Uh, Instagram, uh, you know, built a, a functionality instead of ask me anything, it's ask me how I can help. Um, yeah. Snapchat launched a whole section called here for you. So, you know, Pinterest is, it has pivoted and actually uh, put a custom search um, where basically they're giving people, um, you know, daily inspiration. So, you know, brands are doing anything they can right now to basically try to give back and, and platforms are as well. And it's great to see. So uh, moving on to the poll for, um, for brands. All right, next poll question. Do you believe that post-COVID, post uh, brands will continue to use social media in more human-centric ways? Let's hope so. Um, there was an amazing um, article that sort of talked about kind of gaslighting and the fact that brands will probably revert back to their old ways of communicating, their old ways of pushing messaging. Um, and part of the article talked about the fact that, like, you know, everyone is just going to want to get back to normal, get to back to a place of, like, feeling comfortable again and brands are gonna sort of step in to sort of help people get back to that kind of like feeling of, of comfort and normality. But of course, what they ultimately want is you to continue just to buy their products and services. Um, all right, let's look at, um, let's look at uh, the poll results before we get into some audience Q and A. So um, the results are in. So do you believe that post COVID-19 brands will continue social media in more human centric ways? Yes, 82%, no, 18%. It yeah, seems think, like we I have a very, yeah. very optimistic surprised. audience. Optimistic yeah. audience, I love it. Not a surprise, yeah. Should we get in some questions, Toby? 
Yeah, let's do it. I think, you know, we're getting pretty close to time. First of all, let me just say that, like, you know, just watching the audience participation has just been phenomenal. The chat has been, like, lit up throughout this webinar. So really appreciate everyone being so engaged and so interactive. Um, also appreciate everyone who has taken the time to actually put some questions into the Q&A as well. So uh, first big shout out to, uh, to Cameron Britton, who, uh, um, who jumped in to let us know that um, Charlie D'Amelio actually has 52 million followers on TikTok, which is pretty extraordinary when wow. you think about it. I know. Um, all right, so let's look. So does anyone have, and this is an interesting one, does anyone have any opinions about liquor brands using live streaming or how they can appropriately utilize live streaming while avoiding encouraging overconsumption? That's a great question. Matt, you take this one. Well, I mean, I think liquor brands have always struggled with that, right? How does a liquor brand promote or advertise without encouraging consumption. I think if I'm a liquor brand right now, I'm about supporting. I'm about supporting the barbacks and the bartenders and the waiters and the waitresses and the people who are on the front lines for their on-premise business. Uh, liquor and beer companies are an interesting place. Although their on-premise business, you know, bars, restaurants, nightclubs have basically gone to zero, their off-premise business, people actually ordering in or, or going to grocery stores and buying liquor and beer is up 30%. So relatively speaking, they're doing okay. And I would just like to see these brands do more to give back to the workers, all of which are without a job right now. Um, and I think that's what I would do if I were a liquor or brand um, company. Right. I mean, in many ways, they, they, they don't necessarily need to advertise to increase consumption. They need to play a role. They need to figure out what that role is at this time. I think it was Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser in the UK um, started to work with kind of like local bars to, um, well, some, to, to enable people to buy gift certificates to- Yeah, uh, Heineken, Heineken did the same thing. Right. The same thing. Yeah, it's su su super interesting. That's definitely the right thing to do. All right, here, here's a good one. This is a bit of a conundrum, I think, at the moment in, in, in terms of sort of thinking about where we are now and, and, and ultimately as a, as a brand marketer, how we should sort of think about how to promote um, our products and services in the future. So Kelly Willard asked the following question. Is there any advice to brands who are planning to launch new products or aspects of their brand, but were then delayed by this? For instance, is there anything we can glean from this information that would influence the timing of something like that as it wouldn't be a fully altruistic endeavor. I mean, I, th I, if you know you're going to launch a brand eventually, and maybe you, you can't launch it right now because you know we we identified through our research that the big you know big box retailers have kind of put a pause on their planograms and changing their displays, and obviously, so it's it's hard for manufacturers, CPG companies, to push out new products in retail. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be talking about it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be, um, you know, trying to at least create a little bit of buzz, but you have to do it in the right way. And obviously that's a fine line. You don't want to seem tone deaf, but in the same token, you do have a business to run. And us with Susie, it's been the same thing. Like we are trying to add value, but we also have a business to run. We want to keep our people employed. We want to grow through this. So you really don't want to be too altruistic that you end up having to let go of your employees either, right? Because that's not going to help anybody either. Right, uh, definitely. I have another question from Sandeep. How brand safe is TikTok? Do we have strict measures around brand safety for products which need strict age targeting? Or you want to take that, Toby? Oh, uh, you know, I was really hoping you would. I mean, I would say that, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, all I would say about, about TikTok um, as much as any platform, it, it, it is a little bit of a minefield out there at the moment. There is some recognition that these brand, these platforms, I mean, TikTok, I mean, sorry, YouTube, when you think about it, you know, it's been around for way over a decade and yet they still haven't figured this out yet. It's really difficult. And I know they're putting a ton of resources in to figure it out, but of course, brands are definitely concerned. So with a new platform like TikTok that's growing very quickly that, you know, that, that, you know they're literally, the guys at TikTok are building the airplane as it's taking off. And particularly yeah. in regards to all of its advertising tools and products, um, and in particular around um, thinking about brand safety. So it's definitely hard. I would definitely proceed with caution. But at the same time, brands also have to recognize that this is the time to experiment. This is the time to innovate. It's the time to maybe sort of like let go of some of your concerns. Um, and, you know, I think those that do will probably benefit at the end of the day. But what are your thoughts, Matt? That's well said. That's well said. I mean, I do have specific targeting parameters that they're rolling out, but obviously it's still somewhat the wild west relative to other platforms right now. So proceed with caution, but I don't think that's a reason to not be on a platform like that, especially given its growth. Wait, all right. So I have a question from Milton Camillo. Um, and this question really is about, um, um, you know, sort of small businesses or early stage companies versus bigger and more sure. established companies. So do you 
think that during quarantine, it's better for those that are building a new business or brand or those that are already operating established brands? I mean, I think it all depends on what your business is. Right. If you're selling, uh, you know, N95 masks right now, um, then you're obviously doing quite well. So it depends if I wouldn't launch a, a you know, a, a new restaurant right now. So I think, you know, it all depends on what business you're in. I think if you look, look at history, some of the greatest companies ever created were created during a crisis, whether it was right after 9-11 or right after the 2008 financial crisis. So I think a lot of companies are going to be playing defense right now. And if you have the ability and the market ability to play offense it, and you have the capital to do it, it's certainly a great time to look at doing that. But again, I think it's all based upon your business, your business model, um, and, and basically what you're trying to accomplish. All right, Matt, you're the celebrity and influencer experts, uh, expert, so I'm going to put this question to you, although I do have actually an opinion. But Gary Ennis asks, what celebrities have gone up most in your estimation based on them getting involved and engaged with consumers and fans? Any examples you can share? I mean, I don't know if people would think he's a celebrity, but I think it's Bill Gates. I think Bill Gates has really emerged. It's funny, we did some research for Microsoft, and nearly 60% of the consumers actually still think Bill Gates is the CEO of Microsoft. Um, and he's now two CEOs ago, but he's yeah. so synonymous with that brand. And, you know, he's really become a true thought leader. He's not trying to get anything out of it. He's been, you know, incredibly philanthropic as has the Microsoft company for quite some time, but he's just an individual that, that I'm very impressed with uh, through this. I don't know if you have someone else, Toby. Uh, and, and it's in part due to the fact that you seek out those voices that are offering some level of assurance during this time, a, yeah. steady, a steady and calm authority. You know, he's not necessarily coming up with like his opinion on this pandemic in the moment. He's been working on this for like well over a decade. Exactly. He has a right you know, to play in this space. Right. Yeah. He's, he's invested in like, I don't know, 10 plus different companies who are developing vaccines at this time. He understands what it takes to to be able to kind of ship a product as rapidly as possible. And I, I like you, I think I watched his like LinkedIn live stream. Um, and I was at the time, I just remember thinking, you know what, I, I want to shut out so much of the other noise and just focus on people like Bill, who, who can definitely like, um, you know, guide us sort of through this process. The other person I would mention is Will Smith. I think Will Smith's been doing some fantastic stuff. I think he just, he, he oozes like empathy. He's someone who really understands tone. He understands like, you know, how to connect and communicate with audiences. And he's really sad. He has an amazing team behind him in regards to like, you know, figuring out which platforms and which audiences to engage with and in which ways. Um, so he's definitely doing some really interesting stuff at this time as well. Very cool. Um, all right, let's get to another in, another question here. Da, 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 da. Wow, so many amazing questions. All right, so back to TikTok again. I'll ask this one, it shouldn't take too long. Do you see from your perspective, because you work with a number of brands in the B2B space, do you see any value yeah. in TikTok for B2B brands? Well, I think especially as it goes older. I mean, if you're a B2B marketer, you want to target business decision makers. And there's not too many that are 18 to 24. There's some, right? But most B2B brands are targeting consumers that are more age to say 25 to 54. So as, as it ages up, and the eyeballs are there, it's all about attention, right? If the, the attention is there from business decision makers, you want to be there. It doesn't matter what the platform is. So I think as it matures, both as a platform and as the audience matures and gets slightly older, I do think it's a place B2B brands uh, should play. All right, Rachel Koenig, great question. This is, uh, talks about the, um, whether it's a good idea or not to wash your hands with vodka. Uh, so how do brands effectively show how they are giving back while remaining humble? We have lots of relief efforts happening, but are hesitant to continually post about it because we want to make sure people know where to get help and that we are helping, but we don't want to come off as being boastful. This comes with engagement with consumers as well. For example, Tito's Vodka um, creating hand sanitizer. So any thoughts on that? So I would say two things. First of all, show, not tell. So there's one thing if you're just telling somebody in a very well manicured post that you're doing something, but if you can go live when you're planning the efforts and then when you're actually executing it, I think that's much more authentic. And frankly, people are much more interested in that. So if you can show, not tell, that'd be one. And two is try to get people telling the story for you. So if you look at a, a, an incredible charity, which I know we're both familiar with Toby called Charity Water, you know, what they've done that was so great is that we, my old agency, MRY, built one of the first ever wells. Um, and basically our name in a, you know, a very um, poor country, our company's name was on the side of that well. 
and they took a video of it after it was built and all the local villagers were so incredibly thankful that we built that well and then we had that content and enabled us to share it. So we're telling the charity water story, not charity water. So I think if you can enable others to tell the story for you, um, I think that's incredibly impactful. So Sarah Beth Beals has a question. So we're all experiencing a crisis at this moment in time, but also brands are experiencing their own individual crises. So she asks, I work for a regional insurance company. Uh, we are getting tons of negative feedback on social media because we're not doing discounts and rebates on auto insurance. We're offering rate changes, but people are very mad. Any tips on how to handle? I mean, I think that you probably want to address people's concerns but ultimately those sort of people aren't going to be happy unless you do give them discounts. And I would actually look at my competitive set and just make sure that I'm going about my business practices the right way. Because if all of our competitors are giving discounts and I'm the one that's not, well, then you're putting yourself in a tough position. If it's an unfair expectation, then all you can do is address people's concerns and maybe you could feel good with that decision. Right. We have, we have a question from someone called anonymous. Um, okay. And, and this is a question I think you and I should both take because um, we'll, we'll have sure. some different perspectives, I'm sure. So as we know, of course, um, at the moment, there is a ban on, on public gatherings. So it doesn't matter whether it's a sporting event, a music event, or a social media marketing conference, uh, it is not possible for us to gather in large uh, numbers. I don't know whether we are going to ever be able to gather in large numbers this year. It's very hard to tell and predict. And I certainly don't think we are going to be able to, or at least you're not going to feel safe to until there is a vaccine. So we're going to see the economy open up. We're probably going to see a relaxing of kind of some of these regulations or rules around public gathering over the course of the next like few months, possibly some contraction to follow. But the question is, how do you predict event spaces and event experiences evolving and how they will be able to thrive during this period? So, I mean, I'm of the mindset that things that aren't necessary to go to you shouldn't go to them unless it's completely safe. So if it's not safe for 10,000 people to go there, then to me, it's not safe for anybody unless you actually have to be there. So if you're providing a frontline service, you should go. So to me, it's when is there a vaccine, when there's a reliable treatment for it, where people don't have to wear face masks and there isn't social distancing restrictions. Because if there are, that means there's some semblance of risk. And why would you want to take a health risk by going to a concert or a sporting event? So to me, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, but that's how I'm treating our business. And that's how I'm treating my life personally. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. I'd also sort of add that like safety is one factor, but also you have to kind of ask, the, uh, you have to sort of think about the necessity of something. Like, is this right. even important in the first place? Is it safe? But also, is it important? Because it could be safe, but actually now I've been through this experience and do I really want to get on that plane? Is it worth driving all that way? Is this actually going to be a great experience versus like the you know Travis Scott performance on Fortnite? I think people are going to start asking those questions way more than they would have done normally. I, I, I don't know, that is, Toby. I, I, I don't know if I, I, yes now, but when it's completely safe, can, humans have an inherent desire for community, and experiences and travel and escape. And that I think is built into our DNA. And I don't think that people are gonna stop wanting to do these things. Everyone said consumers would stop traveling internationally after 9-11 and international travel is all time high right before this crisis. So I think eventually when it is safe, this will be a memory and maybe there'll be some remnants, but I don't think it's gonna impact the event industry or the sports industry or the hospitality industry long-term. The question is how quickly is it gonna be before we get back to where we were, in my opinion. My, my, my pushback on that is after 9-11, in the example of like um, um, air travel, there wasn't anything that necessarily kind of existed to provide an alternative to it that could be compared to, and even in some cases could be argued was better. And I think okay. that's what's different. I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination. So what's better, that, Toby? What's better now uh, virtually than, than in person? This. This, doing like a webinar versus a live event? Absolutely. I would argue that the format, the level of interaction and engagement, the way that we can actually package this up really? and send it to people immediately afterwards. I think this particular format for people is way better and way more effective. But I'm not arguing against in-person. What I'm arguing for is to ensure that these in-person experiences exist for a reason, that they matter. Because yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's as much as you can argue that people seek out these experiences, half the time these experiences are really shitty. 
And no one yeah. wants shitty experiences. I don't care. Not how your events. Of it. Your events not are not my events, really. of course. No, absolutely not. All right. I let's agree. move on. Let's move on to another question. Um, all right. So I got so kind of like into that that I lost lost track of um, lost track of my questions. All right. So. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> at the moment, if you're at an agency or at a brand, um, and it's certainly not business as usual, but there is a sort of a mandate coming in from the top that you still need to be pushing out tons of content. How do smaller social media teams kind of like really react to this moment? And what suggestions do you have for keeping your head above water with content? Well, I mean, first you need to know what your strategy is. Like we talked about the escape or utility or community, like what value can we provide? We have a lot of agencies and brands that are licensing Suzy, our research tool to run research on a daily basis and then taking that research and put it in the form of content to add value. You know, 38% of consumers, uh, you know, haven't filled up their gas in the last week. And if you're a shell, uh, you know, that might be interesting um, or how to actually act at the gas station to keep yourself safe or something like that. So where, again, in terms of content, it's like, what does your consumer care about? And where does your brand have a right to play? And that's where your brand could play. And I don't think it matters how big your team is. You just need the right insight to be able to add value to consumers. And that's really what social media marketing has always been about. Right, right. I think that's well said. Uh, another question from Rachel Koenig. Um, we don't typically partner with influencers or celebrities as we don't like to show favoritism. Any suggestions for utilizing such partnerships with brands who have never dipped their toe in the influencer marketing pool before? Well, the first thing I'd ask is, are your consumers worried that you're going to show favoritism? Because what we've found a lot is that brands kind of create their own narrative internally, but never really ask their consumers if that will be the case. And unless you know for sure that consumers will look at you partnering with influencers a form of favoritism, your entire assumption will be wrong. Um, and I think that, again, brands need to humanize themselves. They need, whether you're bringing your CEO as the influencer or you are partnering with another celebrity, I think it's a great way to drive a narrative because when consumers go into the newsfeed on their phone, they want to hear from people and not logos. And I think yeah. as, as, especially, and this crisis has shown us that. Let's, um, let's talk about Susie for a second. So a couple of questions that, that just relate to the study. Can you just talk again, for those of you who may have missed the start, um, how we did this research and the parameters of this particular study? Sure. So Susie is a research tool. We have a U.S. panel of over a million consumers that are on a gamified application where they earn rewards for answering questions. Um, and we targeted a statistically significant uh, cohort of those consumers and asked them a variety of questions. Uh, one of the great things about Suzy is how quick it works and, and how quick you get feedback. So we're able to do research one day and launch a webinar like this the next day. Um, and I think that's a great thing that we can do. And that's why I think these webinars have been so um, incredibly successful. And the other thing we make sure is that our audience is screened and verified. We make sure we get the right people, um, that they're not bots, that they are who they say they are. We go through a pretty intense verification process to make sure that our clients can trust the data coming from our panel. Um, and also, I mean, I think like we, we've talked a lot about the ways in which brands have responded this time. And I think I've been super impressed with you and the way the Suzy team has um, responded and adapted during this time. And obviously you mentioned uh, at the top of the presentation that you built out the COVID-19 um, sort of content and insights hub. Can you sort of talk yeah. a little bit more about that and what people would you know, potentially be able to find? Sure. So we've been doing just nonstop research on this since it started. It just dawned on us very early on that brands were going to be in desperate need of having their finger on the pulse of the consumer. Things are changing so very rapidly. Uh, you know, consumer preferences, for example, at first consumers all went to the wholesale retailers. They went to Costco and Sam's club. Then they stopped going there for groceries because they were worried about contracting the virus. And now they're really doubling down on online grocery delivery. That's just a massive shift that happened in a couple weeks time. And every industry has their own version of that. So what we've tried to do is use our own tool to, to basically become thought leaders in this category specifically. We're tracking sentiment on an ongoing basis. We're identifying certain trends across all industries and we're just sharing it to the public at large. Um, so it's, we found it to be a great resource and it has built our brand. And frankly, it's a great example of content marketing. You know, that's how we're marketing Suzy is by pushing out content, not stop doing webinars like this, really trying to add value. Well, I mean, first of just seeing a, the number of people that have signed up and, and are, are watching this show, those that are still here at this moment in time, even after like 80 minutes of us talking, 
um, speaks to the fact that people are seeking out this content and it's important, it's invaluable. So, you know, I, I just feel very lucky to have the opportunity to sort of participate in this. Quick, quick question actually about sort of the mechanics of these webinars for a second. And by the way, just to the audience, we, we're going to keep going because the questions keep coming in. Um, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll keep plowing through as many of these questions as, 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 as much as we possibly can. So, you know, please do stick around and, and please keep the questions coming as well. So a question about the mechanics of these webinars. Um, how do you compare doing a webinar versus an Instagram live? Um, how do you choose between the different platforms? I definitely have like a thought on this, but uh, and yeah. So it's funny because our, our marketing team, like we've been talking a lot just about what the right platform is for these webinars. Some of our clients have told us they're not able to actually um, access Zoom. So we're probably going to be moving to a new platform for our next webinars. And we're, we want something that's interactive. We want something that can showcase our software tool. Um, we want something that's going to be easy, that doesn't involve a software download. Um, Instagram Live is, it's interesting because you see a lot of DJs on Instagram Live, but even with Instagram Live and DJs, it's missing something like the sound isn't there. You can't plug it into your sound system. So I think that's an opportunity for a new platform to be built that allows DJs to in, in really high def, um, you know, video and sound really be able to do these live concerts. Cause I'm not sure Instagram live is the best platform for that. I think Instagram live is great for kind of impromptu Q and A's because of the discovery. So we promote these webinars by aggressive B2B marketing tactics, whether it be email or paid social, et cetera. The great thing about Instagram live is it's serendipitous. You know, you could all, everyone's on Instagram all the time and you'll see somebody that's live or two people talking and you'll log into it. So I think it's not appointment viewing, but there's a time and place for that. And it's much more serendipitous. Um, and I think something like Zoom or other platforms like it are great for that appointment viewing, getting people to register, you know, us collecting information of who's on, opening up new relationships, et cetera. Yeah, it'd be nice to push this out on Instagram Live, um, obviously yeah. to re reach reach new audiences. But yeah. and obviously that there is that feature in terms of you know push this on Facebook Live. But I think you're right. It's it's really about understanding like what what, are you, what is your objective? Like why are you even hosting this thing in the first place? What do you 100%. want? What value do you want to create for the audience? And in what ways do you want the audience to participate? Because this particular format you know works really well. There's so much missing, I think, in terms of. Uh, functionality that would be great to have but yeah I mean, again, it's, listen, it's hard not to be able to, it's not hard not to be able to see everyone you know you talk about like the difference like i love going on stage i love going on stage at social media week and there's a rush presenting in front of a thousand people at your events and the serendipity of running into somebody um you know in the lobby or whatever it may be like that's what you miss and that's what you know i think that the virtual atmosphere doesn't really provide and you know i think obviously you can only do what you can do and I think there is some benefits, but there's also a lot of things that, you know, these virtual events need to have. Right, right. Um, let, let's, we, we had a question about your favorite celebrity. What, what has really been your favorite brand during this time or the brand that you have been most inspired by? Hmm. I'd have to think about that. I mean, I've, so, I've been really inspired by this All In Challenge just because I think it's been so impactful. I think Pepsi's done great work um, in terms of what they've done with the live entertainment and, and partnering up. So that's probably one brand uh, that comes to mind. I'd like to see more from the beer and liquor companies in terms of giving back uh, because the, that hospitality industry, I saw you know, live footage from Vegas this morning and you literally could stand on the street and do jumping jacks. The, you know, the, the unemployment rates are crazy there. So, um, but that's one. And I think a lot of the banks have really tried to step it up whether it be forbearance of payments and things of that nature. Um, and I think a lot of companies realize that they need to save the consumer that will one day be their customer again. Right. Well, listen, I think um, we've, we've got through a ton of the Q and A and a ton of questions. I want to be conscious of our audience's times. I'm sure they have uh, very important jobs to get back to as well. So sure. let's wrap up. Yeah. So I guess, uh, for myself and on behalf of our team from Susie, I just want to thank everybody for joining. If you have any questions about Susie, about our research, um, about how we conducted this research, uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. My email address is, uh, is projected on the screen, mattb at suzy.com. Um, I just want to give a special shout out to our team that spread out um, all over the place. Um, Avi Savar and Abel and Kevin and uh, our entire marketing team has done a tremendous job of pulling this together. So I just want to thank them, uh, Maddie Brown as well for their help in pulling this together. Yeah, likewise, I just want to sort of give a shout out to my team um, for you know, collaborating on this particular project and also, you know, hu huge uh, um, kudos to my team for helping to kind of like 
work through this period, pivot, come up with SMW1 and launch it. If you are interested in learning more about SMW1, just go to smw1.com. You can get all the information about our conference, which launch, launches on Tuesday, May 5th and runs all the way through to May 28th. Yeah, and once again, we will be sending out a live recording of this uh, video as well as a downloadable version of the deck that you can share. Um, once again, I'm Matt Britton, CEO of Susie. I want to thank everybody for coming. Stay safe. Uh, we're going to be producing a bunch more of these webinars. Hopefully, we'll do something again with Toby and the Social Media Week team because I think this has been great. Uh, thank you guys very much. Stay safe. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.